Welcome to Sustainable Kashi's free permaculture class. We're so glad you could all make it. Today is really exciting because we're talking about social permaculture. And we are very happy to offer these classes in this time of COVID to give us a chance to all come together and smile and network and see each other's wonderful faces and learn about what we're all doing. Uh, we'll start by getting a little interaction here. I think this is a great way for people to interact. Um, and so I wanna talk about what projects you're all working on. So if you have a project that you're currently working on that you want to share with all of us, maybe to get some help from everybody or just to talk about what you're doing, uh, go ahead and raise your hand. All right, Tiffany, what are you doing? No, take your time. We can hear you. Good morning, everyone. So right now I'm in the process of starting a food forest in my backyard and my newest idea is that I want to get, I only have one milkweed plant, but I want to release a bunch of monarch butterflies in my backyard. Um, and so that's my newest idea. I'm going to look at where I can order those. Um, and then I'm a volunteer at the Gulfport Food Forest. I'm in St. Petersburg, Florida. And so that's really um, nearby. And I... I'm growing a lot of turmeric as well and working on selling that in different health food stores and juice bars. And so that's kind of what I'm working on right now. Awesome. The milkweed is a great place to start. I love the uh, monarch butterflies. Uh, you can also put in the large leaf milkweed, which is another beautiful uh, variety. Oh, and I forgot to mention that I'm starting a medicinal herb garden. Um, it's right outside of my kitchen window. And I'm really excited about that. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Uh, thank you so much. If anybody has any milkweed seeds, please contact Tiffany. Yes, please. <laughs> Anyone else have a project you're working on? You can just raise um, your hand. I'd like to talk about, I don't know where is the raising hands, so <laughs> I'm sorry. Perfect. No, you're good. <laughs> um, I'm Roya from Denver, Colorado. I know Elliot. Um, from back then in Colorado, and I just bought a um, bus, library bus, um, and uh, we're going to be um, renovating it to the preschool serving three to five years old. And um, for this summer, I want to provide um, um, hands-on um, projects, you know, because, because of the COVID, many preschools are closed, you know, so we're going to be uh, showing how to plant gardens, how to do things, you know, so <laughs> um, this is my project and the bus just arrived yesterday from Ohio and um, so I'm really excited about it. I don't know where the share um, over here is for me to share the picture of the bus, but anyway, um, this is what I'm working on and we're going to be converting it to the preschool program and get licensed and after the summer program, we're going to be doing that. And I'm hoping that when we get Elliot back here in summer, maybe he can get involved with some of that. <laughs> providing oh, yeah. growing Thank stuff. You. Oh my goodness. It's so nice of you to plug in with the, the, the children and, and seeds and libraries and all uh, that's, that's a fantastic program. Thank you so much. I, I would You're love welcome. to keep up and watch that bus, see how it grows. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, James Clater. Hey, how's it going? I'm in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and uh, recently starting a community garden at a marina in Madisonville, Louisiana. So kind of a place for people that live on their boats to come get like herbs and pick uh, fruit. And we just planted a fig tree and a mulberry tree. And that's kind of like the beginnings of the community garden. And then uh, other than that, just growing plants in my backyard. And uh, I inoculated this big pile of pecan mulch uh, with King Strafaria mushrooms about a year ago. And uh, I'm just starting to get the first little fruit I noticed uh, yesterday, a little mushroom coming up. Um, and then I also ordered chickens from mypetchicken.com. And I'm working on building a chicken coop. So. Those are some of the projects I'm working on. Wow, wow, sounds like you're very busy out there. Um, I'd love to get your contact because uh, I'm a 
boat captain and uh, I'd love to come get some herbs from you. Oh, for sure. Come check out the marina. Plenty of space. <laughs> nice. I always need a destination, so it's fantastic. Uh, we have time for a couple more. If anybody uh, wants to share a project, just raise your hand. Or if uh, I can't see you, just unmute yourself. Hey, Josh, you want to wanna tell us what you're doing? Yeah, hey. Um, so I just came back from a, an exchange in Nicaragua, and I was working there with a um, young biointensive farm. Um, but the, the lady there who is starting the whole thing up wanted me to um, design a couple of permaculture beds for her. And I have absolutely no experience in permaculture design, but I thought that was a, a, a cool project to take on and see, see what I could do with it. So I had to come back due to COVID. I'm, I'm in Florida now, but, um, but I thought I could help her out virtually. So, uh, so I'm, I'm designing those for her. And the other thing that I'm working on is um, uh, I got really passionate about uh, mushroom growing when I came back home too. So, uh, so I started up my first couple of buckets of mushrooms in my garage and uh, I'm just growing mushrooms in my parents' garage now. So it's, it's fun. I had my first flush a couple of days ago it came really early and I have no idea what I'm doing, but it's just so much fun. <laughs> and I had them last night. They're really tasty. So that's what I'm working on. Oh, it's wonderful. You and James have to get together and talk about the, uh, the garden giants. Those King Strafarias are really wonderful mushrooms. And yeah, totally. Um, I'm growing a golden oyster and um, pink oyster because I'm in probably the most humid place in the U.S. right now. And, uh, and uh, they're working pretty well. Yeah, in a few weeks, we'll have uh, Caitlin uh, on to talk about mushrooms with us. So uh, you'll want to definitely be on that class as well. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Like an alien. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk a little bit about this whole project. Lisa, yay. I would love to hear about your project. Um, so I've been living in an apartment for the past two years. And outside of the apartment is a good parcel of land that was neglected. And the previous tenants had left literally like treadmills to rot and old beer bottles and cans. And um, last year I cleared a good area and then got free wood chips delivered from a local arborist. And it was like literally a dump truck full of wood chips. And so this was my initial phase of the garden project last year was to take the wood chips and spread them out in the area that I was designating to be a plant uh, produce and pollinator garden. So that was done last year and then this year I was able to receive donations from local neighbors of very large containers that they weren't using anymore um, because I didn't want to plant in the ground because I'm in an apartment so I don't know the longevity of my project but I really was committed to making something happen. So I was able to secure a combination of very large pots, um, plant starts from local neighbors. My local library has um, a seed library where you can get seeds for free and they have a list and you simply request um, whatever you'd like and they offer it to the community and then um, just yeah various things were, were given to me and I started this project and so I'm just at the point where about two weeks ago I planted everything out outside there were seedlings inside for the first yeah four to six weeks now everything's outside and I'm already starting to notice the slugs and the bugs and different things coming so I don't know what's going to be successful, but it's been a really fun project to envision and plan and turn a space that had been previously neglected into what could be a very productive, um, at least food garden for myself. I've got herbs growing and um, tubers, vining plants, flowers, um, pollinator plants, and a few trees. So yeah, it's really fun. Wow. Sounds like a wonderful project. And I love that area you're at near Asheville. It's that's yeah. that Black Mountain area has been one of the best chanterelle mushroom foraging sites I've ever been to. So uh, you're, you're in a great I'm spot. Back and visit. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to come see you. Yeah. Well, wonderful, wonderful. We'll get started now and all these exciting projects. We can talk more about these projects in the Facebook community page afterwards because I'd love to know what you're all doing and how we can all help each other um, really be successful in these projects. So it's wonderful, wonderful to be here uh, talking about social permaculture. And when I think of social permaculture, I really think of this feeling of interdependence and how we're all connected. And this is really important to me um, in uh, the permaculture philosophies and techniques. Um, personally, I don't want to be independent. 
And when I first started permaculture, I was really excited about doing everything myself. I wanted to grow my own food and co uh, collect my own water and do everything by myself. But I've really changed the way I've thought. And now I really want to be interdependent and really be part of a community. Um, and so I, this really became prevalent to me when I was building the Econ Farm, which is a log cabin in uh, East Orlando. And when I built it, I just wanted to be totally self-sufficient, you know, and not need anybody else. And then I, I realized that, that, that that's very lonely. <laughs> that's, we need each other. We need to reflect our light off of each other. And so we built a community uh, chicken coop and we built a, a, a chicken coop in which all the neighbors could come in. They help, would help take care of the chickens and then they would all get eggs. And this chicken coop ended up becoming a hub in which everybody would meet and talk and share. And then all of a sudden it, that was just a seed. And next thing you know, we saw, saw it started seeing gardens pop up in the neighborhood where everybody would share work in the gardens. And the community, which before we had started these projects, never really talked to each other, started working together so beautifully. And the social dynamics from these shared interdependent projects really created this network that turned into some beautiful projects. And I think nature shows us this in uh, so much in forests and natural systems where every system is really connected, supporting each other. And I think the biomimicry is really the model we're looking at in imitating the patterns of nature. So we're really excited to introduce Elliot, who is a very diverse background of permaculture and physics and uh, human relationships. Uh, he's an author, a facilitator, a systems designer, and he lives right here in Florida in Orlando. And uh, he has a lot of experience in biomimicry, which I would love to hear more about. And uh, I'm very excited to welcome Elliot to the call. Thank you so much, Terry. It's so good to be here. It's good to see so many people joining in, friends I have around the country and lots of new faces as well. Uh, big thanks to you, Terry, for hosting these classes. You didn't give your own plug, I don't think, but they do these every single Wednesday at 9 a.m. So if this is your first one that you're tuning into, definitely come back and check out the rest of the classes uh, that they're offering. Um, so as Terry mentioned, this is going to be an intro to social permaculture. And we're going to be, I kind of take a unique look at social permaculture, I think, uh, and this is going to be aimed at people who have no experience in permaculture and who have lots of experience in permaculture. I'm trying to make it accessible to everybody. Um, so in the interest of doing a good intro beforehand, I just wanted to introduce what permaculture is and what social permaculture is at a high level and kind of where we'll be going in this presentation. So as Terry already mentioned, permaculture is all about working with nature and trying to bring the patterns that exist in the natural world and incorporate them into our world. And that could be in the form of creating gardens and looking at ecosystems as inspiration for how we could design a food forest, for example. But those same patterns can also be applied to how we design uh, social relationships. Um, I'm gonna share my screen, actually, I don't think I'm a, I've got the hosting abilities. Terry, can you make me co-host so I can share a screen? Amy has Somewhere. all those abilities. Okay, awesome. Yes, you should be good. I just saw something pop up. Let's see. It says recording. I still don't see the screen sharing. Okay, just a second. <clears throat> If we don't have it, that's okay. I can do it without the screen share. I yeah. believe we disabled that effect because we had a little bit of problems with that. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, we're, um, so it's just, just disabled for everybody? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think I'd have to go back into the settings of the call. Okay, no problem then. Um, I'll try it, but you go ahead right now. Sounds good. Okay, so the motivation for social permaculture is all about addressing the current situation that we have on this planet. And I think we can probably all agree that there's so much that is broken and hurting and in need of 
deep healing uh, in the world today. And really how so many of our structures today are set up are in exact conflict with how the natural world is set up. We have so many of these linear open loop systems where we extract from nature, use something for a short period, and then you know, throw it in the landfill. And that same kind of linear process happens with the actual materials that we use, whether it's our gasoline or plastics or whatever, but it also happens with ourselves and kind of humans exist in this pipeline and there's a lot of waste and not, there's just broken relationships and it's really a betrayal in my view of the human spirit. And in order to move towards a better, more vibrant world uh, in which you know, people are living together in harmony with each other and with the natural world, we need to start at the top of what is essentially like a watershed. And that's with ourselves as individuals and how we look at the world, how we interact with the world and how we interact with each other. I think it's really true that we have so many of the tools and technologies available to us that can allow us to live in harmony with nature. Like it's no secret really how to you know, grow food and provide for our basic needs or do composting toilets. A lot of the technologies that we need are pretty well available. Uh, but what's really missing, I think, is our relationship to all these il different elements. And it's that personal relationship that we have that is our highest leverage point in transforming the world and creating the future uh, that we want to have. So, but at the same time, I want to emphasize uh, one of the permaculture ethics, which is kind of the fourth ethic. It's not one of the official permaculture ethics uh, that was described originally when permaculture was created, um, but it's come, especially in the last decade, I think, or two decades, and it's called the transition ethic. And this is a great way to frame the work that we do towards this building cultural and social healing, because it allows us to understand that we're working within a broken system. And we have to kind of cut ourselves some slack and be gentle with ourselves as we do that work. And the transition ethic is all about the slow process that this healing of these relationships with each other and the planet has to have. And so while it is certainly possible for us as individuals to make really dramatic changes and like one person can totally transform the relationship they have with the land and with the people around them. A great example of that is Rob Greenfield who last year, you know, spent 365 days foraging and harvesting 100% of all the food that he ate. So that's definitely a demonstration that it is possible to separate ourselves from some of these linear extractive systems that we have in the world to separate totally. Um, but it was a full-time job for him and everything that he was doing was totally focused on that one goal of foraging and harvesting 100% of his food. And the fact is that's simply not the reality that most of us have accessible to us. And so while it might be great for us to eat 100% local food, we don't need to hold us to that same, to that perfectly high standard just because we have a vision of how the world should be or what a healed world would look like and we're so far from that now it doesn't mean that the small steps that we take day in and day out are not worth it just because they haven't totally met that high standard that we have so this is called the transition ethic you know we need to live within the system to a certain extent in order to change it and especially when we're talking about changing some of the really most deeply ingrained systems in the world, whether that's government systems or global economic systems. You know, these people don't necessarily know who Rob Greenfield is. They don't even have the vision of this ideal future. And in order to make this transition possible, we have to meet people where they're at and we have to meet the system that we currently have where it's at. And so part of that is just being gentle with ourselves and forgiving ourselves and each other for how the, the, damage, the damage systems that we have set up all around us. So it's okay to work within those. So this is the idea of the transition ethic. Um, so the, the 
majority of this presentation is going to be focused not so much on particular strategies that you could apply to a social system, but more of the high level structures that we see in systems in nature that we also see in social systems. So the idea here being before we want to jump in and start implementing a bunch of changes into a system, and this is true, whether it's a landscape or a social system, it's really key to sink in and understand how these systems operate at a fundamental level and how the natural world, how the patterns of the natural world manifest in our lives as they are right now. And once we have a deeper understanding of that, then we can start to move towards implementing some of the strategies of social permaculture. So a lot of presentations of social permaculture might focus on like specific tools that we have, like time-based currencies or alternate governance structures, you know, things that are really like strategy focused. And this is not going to be really that introduction. I'm going to introduce some of those things at the end, but the primary focus of this is about what are the big picture patterns that exist in our social world and in the natural world? And how can we start to see the social systems that we have through this lens of permaculture before we even talk about what a social permaculture organization would look like? We wanna understand what are the different patterns that are available to us. Um, so the basics, really at the, at the, at the top, we have, ourselves as individuals. We are the, every person in the world is kind of the top of the watershed when it comes to our social systems. And as a result, it's what we have the most power to change. So if we want to, you know, it's the classic saying, you have to start with yourself, start with a man in the mirror, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. All these phrases exist because it's really true that the society that we have is built up of the individual perspectives of all the people that are a part of it. And this is related to a tool in permaculture called the scales of permanence. And when we're talking about landscape, the scales of permanence is about starting, your, starting to implement designs at the level where things don't change over time. So you're going to start with the most permanent things first and work your way down from there. So if we're designing a landscape, we're going to start with how the earth itself is shaped. So the reason we start with how the earth itself is shaped because, is because it's going to affect everything that comes afterwards. So if we have a slope, you know, it's going to have a south side and a north side. And it's going to have a wet side and a dry side. And so that's going to affect the soil conditions and the water conditions and the plants and all the other things that we're going to add on top of that. So in the social system, the highest scale of permanence that we have, even before things that we can change are the things that we can't change, the things that are fundamental to all people and all cultures. So these are things like human nature, whatever, however we define that. It's not like we can you know, point our finger and know exactly what that means, but it's really important to recognize that maybe there are certain aspects of ourselves that we can't change. You know, we're biological machines. We have certain metabolic needs. Um, we have an evolutionary history that gives us a lot of like the instincts that we have and the basic tendencies that we have. Other things that we can't change that are really high on the scale of permanence are things like uh, the laws of physics and thermodynamics, the laws of natural selection that govern how organisms evolve over time. Uh, and then once we, the next scale in the scale of permanence for a social system is all the personal individual stuff. And this is called zone zero. So it's the very first place that you go in a landscape or in a social system is, with, is within, it's yourself. And that's things like your, your personality are found there, your individual drives and motivations, things like that. The next scale of permanence for a social system would be the values of that system. So that would be things like the value of healing, for example. So in sustainable Kashi and in the permaculture community, the value of healing is so central and something that was is established at the very beginning before any work is done, before any rules are created about how we're going to behave or any you know, strategies are implemented for how we're gonna affect the change that we wanna see 
we need to create that value system. So this is high on the scales of permanence. Next under that would be the rules and procedures that we have. So these would be things are about what are, is and is not allowed you know, in this social system. Things about how decisions are made, things about how conflict is settled, more of these procedural things. Those are a lot easier to change than the personalities of the members and the values of the group as a whole. So that's why we wanna start, uh, we wanna wait to try to change those things until we really have the foundation of the values established. And then finally, on the scales of permanence, uh, things that are more easily changed within an organization is like the operations of how things are actually done. So whether you use a work from home model or everyone goes into the office, you know, that's a procedural change where it's relatively straightforward to change and changing it is not going to fundamentally alter what your organization does because it's at a lower level of impact. So in order to make change in a social system, we need to start at those higher levels and redefine our relationships that we have with ourselves and our value systems and kind of work from there. Um, so the next, I wanna talk about different ways that social systems are arranged. And these are kind of the archetypal structures that we build social systems out of. And this is the, these are the same kind of structures that natural systems are built from. And these are fractal patterns. So a fractal is something that looks similar to itself at all scales. So if you look at a tree, for example, and you look at the very tip of the tree branch, it looks like a miniature version of the entire tree. So these fractal structures are created because every element of the structure is following the same rules, no matter how big that structure is. And those rules are determined by what the function of the structure is. So as the structure grows over time, it's continuing to basically accomplish the same thing. So in the case of a tree, it's branching outwards for a few reasons, one of which would be to maximize the surface area that it has on the outside. And so the reason that it looks the same is because every component within it is trying to reach a certain goal. And these structures we see everywhere in social systems as well. Uh, so most, pretty much everywhere you look, you can find what some of these fractal patterns and each of them has a benefit to its implementation and they have drawbacks to its implementation. So a lot of times in uh, you know, progressive communities, we see hierarchical systems, like we might have a CEO at the top and then, you know, vice presidents and et cetera, all the way down to like manual laborers who don't have impact at the top level. We view those systems as bad, that we want to get away from those and create more democratic processes. But the reality is that every structure that's found in nature, like a hierarchy in that example, has a purpose and it has a place where it can be applied and uh, we can, by understanding what the different functions of these fractals are, we can learn where to smartly implement them, where they're needed in a social system. So I just wanna go through quickly the four major classes of fractals that we see in nature and talk a little bit more about what their function is in nature and how that can apply to a social system. So the first one that we've already touched on is the hierarchy. So in the hierarchy, we have uh, branching patterns. So think about like a tree or the structure of your lungs is another example. A watershed is another example of a hierarchical structure. This, these structures are designed to allow energy and materials to flow in one direction. So they'll flow from the top of the hierarchy to the bottom, trickling down or they could also flow in the opposite direction from the bottom up to the top. But they're not gonna flow like horizontally as easily. So the, they're limited in that sense. So they're very good at efficiently transporting things, which is why a tree uses them, it's why your lungs use them, it's because your lungs are delivering oxygen you know, to your blood and your body. That's a pretty one directional transportation. It doesn't need to be distributed. Um, so it's really good at efficiently distributing things. But the downside, of course, is that they bottleneck the power. 
So if there's a change that happens at the higher level, like the top of the hierarchy, that is going to affect everyone downstream without their input at all. So the, the higher up you get, the more impact you have over the rest of the system. And as a result of this, it's also more of a fragile system. If you sever that connection in the hierarchy, the entire system will fail. You know, if you cut a tree down, you have destroyed every single node and branch above it. So it's a very fragile way to set up a system. So that's the, the primary downside. The kind of opposite of the hierarchy fractal is the web fractal, where things are distributed horizontally. So examples of this in nature include things like fungal networks underneath the ground. It includes a spider web. It includes the neurons in your brain. And what these structures are really good at is distributing things evenly throughout the entire system. So in a fungal system underground, for example, that the fungi that live with the plants underground are really good at distributing water and nutrients everywhere in the forest ecosystem. And that's one of the primary strengths that they have in the ecosystem is their ability to keep things in balance that way. It allows anyone to enter the system at any point. There is no up or down or like, there's no special direction really in any kind of web. So it's very democratic in that way. As a result, it's also very resilient because you can take out any one node and it's not gonna affect the rest of the system because you can still connect everything together. There's a lot of redundancy in the web structure. So the benefit is democratic and it allows, it's a lot more flexible than the hierarchy. It's a lot more resilient than the hierarchy. But the downside is that it's really inefficient and energy intensive. So if you have two things that are on opposite sides of a web, it's not so straightforward to implement a change on one end and have that change get to the other side in a really efficient way. So communication can be very difficult in the web. And we see that you know, everywhere we see a web, we see this inefficiency. It's why our brains use more energy than any other part of our body. You know, our brain consumes like 20% of the calories of our entire body, just because it, it takes so much energy and effort to keep that web structure in place. It's the same reason why consensus decision making, if we're talking about social groups, is really difficult and time consuming. And it becomes more and more difficult the more people that you have involved. You know, if you have two people, like a married couple, for example, we already know that couples can disagree and get into conflict really easily with just that single, there's two relationships. There's a relationship from one person to the other and the other person to them. And that's already really difficult to maintain. And then when we start to add additional people and bring more people into a horizontal decision, there just becomes so many more relationships that it becomes really inefficient and difficult to manage. So when you have three people, now each person has an individual relationship with the other people. So now all of a sudden there's like four or five different relationships. And as you add people to systems like this, the number of individual relationships within it grows exponentially fast. So as you add to the, the web structure, it becomes less and less, in a, less and less efficient the bigger it gets. It gets more difficult to know where everything is and to have information travel smoothly within it. So that's the downside of the web structure. Uh, the crystal is our third fractal. And the crystal is a fractal that basically doesn't change. So in a crystal, it, it's a repeating grid of, in a physical example, it's a repeating grid of atoms that all are the same exact position with relation to each other and they never change. The benefit of this structure is that it allows information to pass through extremely easily and extremely predictably. And there's not very much that you can do to change or interfere with how the crystal operates. So it's that strength that gives them widespread application and communication technology. You know, all of us are watching this meeting on computers that are made of crystals. All of the fiber optic cables that carry the internet are made of crystals. 
And the reason we use crystals in these applications is because they allow information to travel smoothly through and they're highly predictable. The social analogy or the personal analogy is going back to the scales of permanence. It's the things in our system, our social system, that are least subject to change, that are the hardest to penetrate. So the crystalline structure of an organization could be its values, if your organization has a set of written values. That's kind of the lens, and a lens is another example of a physical crystal. It's the lens through which everything else in the organization is done. And as a result, it has such huge power over everything else that happens within that social system. But it's also one of the hardest things to change about that system. So it's really important that when you're designing any of these deep, unchanging structures in a social system, that you spend the time that it requires to try to get it right from the beginning. Because once these things are codified in an the organization, they're so difficult to change. The last structure, which I'm just going to kind of gloss over, is the spiral. So the spiral structure in nature is the growth structure. So this is how like a snail shell grows in a spiral. And the strength that it has is that it slowly builds on itself over time. So in permaculture, one of the permaculture principles that we have is use small, slow solutions. And the reason is because a system is not capable of just doing a bunch of stuff if it hasn't really done anything before. You need to build on your existing successes in order to flourish as an organization over the long term and not bite off more that you can chew. So how a spiral is formed is you start with just like one little node and then it adds a node next to it. And then now there's two, so you can add two more. So each one continues to add another. And so as you turn the spiral, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger based on what's already been built. And I think this is a really great pattern to look at, especially in the context of the transition ethic that we talked about earlier, is that it really, to manifest change in a social system or any system, we just need to start with what we have control over, which is ourselves and our immediate families and circumstances and the people that we surround ourselves with. And as we do that individual work, will start to pull other people in. And the more people you have, the more people can be brought in. And it's the slow, organic, kind of spiral-like process. Um, so we're running a little short on time. I want to just touch on the real strength of these fractals is in their combinations. So each one has a strength, has strengths and weaknesses. And in order to apply them successfully in our social systems, we need to learn how to combine them together. So the human body is a perfect example of this where we have hierarchical structures nested within uh, web structures. So our nervous system, like our hands, this is a hierarchy. You know, the tip of my finger is like the very end of the nerve line that's connected all the way up to my brain. So that's really, the strength of that is that I have central control over my hand. I can, operate all of my extremities with precision and efficiency. Obviously, it's not strong because if I cut off my arm, then everything downstream of it doesn't work. Or if I start to, if something at the top of the hierarchy, like my mind is corrupt, then I can use this hand to do some terrible evil thing and there's not checks and balances in place. So that's why in humans, the top of our hierarchy, the most vulnerable place, our brain, is itself a web. So we put the web structure, which is strongest at democracy and checks and balances and collaboration, right in the place in the hierarchy that needs those qualities the most. So when we're designing any kind of social system, we can think about how to layer these different fractals together to use their strengths where appropriate and make sure we have others in place to take over for wherever they have weaknesses. So finally, I just want to touch on different strategies that we can actually implement in a social permaculture setting. So in social permaculture, these would be equivalent to the permaculture approaches of like composting or rainwater catchment or swales, all these different things that we can implement in a system. Those are really the last things you want to think about in your design is what are you actually going to be putting in. You want to first think about how 
how is the whole system going to work together? What are the whole system's values and goals? And finally, what are the individual tools that we can use? So some of the tools that we can use in social permaculture and in non-social permaculture are zone analysis. So zone analysis is about putting, defining where you have the most impact and then making kind of concentric circles outward. So in landscape permaculture, again, your zone zero is yourself. Your zone one might be your house or whatever around your house and outwards and outwards until zone four or five is just the wild where you have no impact at all. You can do the same analysis for a social system. Uh, we can use the permaculture principles, of course. So there's 12 permaculture principles. These are kind of the master patterns of nature. And it's essentially the cheat code. If you want to do something in permaculture but not put that much thought into it, just look at the permaculture principles and toss a few of them in and you'll probably make something that, that was better than what you had already. Um, I do a really deep dive into the permaculture principles in an article I wrote on Medium. So you can go on there and read a social permaculture perspective of each of the 12 principles. Another one is niche analysis. So this is taking an account of all the inputs and outputs of your system. And by doing that, you can spot where the holes are in the system and figure out how to make the different elements fit together. Um, we have things like alternative economies. So these are things like time-based currencies, gift economy, bartering. These are a bunch of tools that we can use. And then we have things like governance structures. These would be different types of decision-making models and so on that we can use in social permaculture. Uh, so this was, that's the high level view. I have a lot of resources that you can find online. If you go particularly to Medium, just search my name, Elliot Kurzgaard. There's four or five different articles where I do deeper dives into a lot of these social permaculture topics. Um, and there's plenty of other books and stuff out there as well. Uh, so I wasn't monitoring the questions, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions here. And we can also move to the online. I'll turn it back to you, Terry. Oh, Elliot, thank you so much. I love your, uh, your framework of putting the scales of permanence uh, over a social concept. That's fantastic. And I've never even dived into fractals. Wow, that's fantastic. That, that outlay is really beautiful. And the function of the fractals working in a social system is somewhere I've never gone. So please um, tell us where people can find you and tell us uh, what you're doing. Sure. So uh, you can find me just by searching my name, Elliot Kurzgaard. I'm on all the social media platforms. Most of my writing is on Medium. And you can also reach me directly, just elliotkurzgaard at gmail.com. Um, I'll drop that into the chat uh, here in just a second. And as for, what was the other part? Just what, what I've got going on, what I'm yeah. doing. So I'm actually regrettably not doing a ton of permaculture stuff right now. Uh, just I'm working full time as a public relations director for a solar company, actually. So pretty divergent, but I get to bring in a lot of the, I, I, I get to do permaculture in my job in a certain sense. Um, I'm involved with the Orlando permaculture community. So if anyone's in the Orlando area or even anywhere, now that we're doing our meetings online, you don't have to be in the Orlando area where we do every second Tuesday of the month, we have a meeting. So the next one is actually going to be a alternative economies or permaculture economics of permaculture, something like that. So it's another permaculture theme that's in a couple weeks. Um, I've also been involved in the Permaculture Action Network, mostly out in Colorado. That's an organization that uh, organizes action days for people to get their hands dirty and help out community uh, places. Um, that is obviously kind of on hold with the events right now, but you can find Permaculture Action Network on Facebook and whatnot, and they're doing webinars weekly as well. Uh, so there's a ton of research, resources out there for everyone. Uh, James is with the Permaculture Action Network too out in uh, New Orleans. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's, it's wonderful. And thank you for your donation this week. Um, Elliot has donated a one hour social permaculture consultation for the winner from our Sustainable Kashi community um, question, which this week will be, uh, how can a tool from the social permacultures we just learned help you in nurturing relationships in your community? 
that'll be reposted in the community page and which Amy will type up right now. Um, uh, we want to give a huge thanks to Amy Zelt for running all our productions. She's the reason we're able to all be on the call right now. Um, and thank you for your technical expertise and your time and care in getting us all together. Um, so we look forward to answering your questions in Sustainable Kashi Community. Elliot will be joining us there. And uh, if you have any questions about today or anything more, we can all meet there. Um, there's a quote that says, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go with a tribe. And I think that is one of the best reflections of the value of social permaculture. Uh, we hold valuable tools for us to live interconnected lives and we're stronger together. And social permaculture gives us a, a way of reaching that. Um, after our bellies are full, after our water tanks are full, after our batteries are full, there comes a time when we got to interact with each other. <laughs> and this is a, a part of permaculture that, that gets missed a lot. Um, so it's really wonderful to be spending this time on social permaculture. Uh, next week, we're going to have Corrine Brennan talking about resiliency, which in this time is just fantastic uh, in the COVID era. So you'll definitely want to come next week and uh, listen to Corrine share her beautiful wisdom. Um, I really wanna thank everybody for being here. Thank you everybody for being on the call. And we look forward to talking to you more in the Facebook uh, Sustainable Kashi community page. Uh, thank you so much for spending your time here and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you. You're Jerry. welcome. Thank you, Amy. Really beautiful class. That was amazing. Thank <laughs> all right, you. I'll see you all in the group. <laughs>